All right, it's uh, Chris DeCenso here. Welcome to Listen and Learn, Obtaining Customer Feedback and Input to Grow Sales and Profits. I'd like to first thank the NASUW. Uh, Kenyon Gleason's on the line. Kenyon, I'd like to say a few words to get us started. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. I know you have some busy schedules, so welcome to the webinar. Hopefully, you'll get some great tips and uh, tricks here today. I know Chris and his team, uh, George and everybody at Growth Strategy Partners has done a number of these webinars for us in the past. They've been very successful and very well attended, as today's is as well. Uh, so I want to thank Chris and George for putting this together and uh, continuing to do this uh, on behalf of NESGW. I want to also thank uh, Jeff from Sig Sauer and Jens from STI International, who will be, uh, you'll be hearing from today as well. And of course, I want to also just say real quick, I uh, look forward to seeing and meeting many of you in New Orleans here the last week of October for our annual expo. I know many of you have been there. It'll be my first time as the head of NESGW, so I'm very much looking forward to it. We're working on all kinds of planning and strategic initiatives here as we get closer and closer. and so. I've got a lot of uh, things on my plate as we're getting things geared up, but if you need anything, please do give us a call, and we'll certainly help you in whatever way we can. Hopefully, you can come in the night before the show opens on the 27th and join us for our awards dinner this year. We're going to have Wayne LaPierre from the NRA as our featured speaker, in addition to all of our industry awards and that sort of thing. So, uh, Wayne, I'm sure, will give us an update on what's new in the political arena and the latest from Washington, D.C. Of course, many of you probably saw the debates last night. We haven't figured too prominently in, in much of the national conversation, but uh, no doubt the folks at NRA and NSSF and others are, are tracking and, and watching all of that. So we'll definitely get a great update from those folks, and uh, obviously we'll, we'll have a lot of networking opportunities for you as well. So look forward to seeing you there. Again, Chris and George, thanks so much for putting this on. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say today. And uh, folks, again, if you need anything in advance of the show, be sure to give our office a call. Thanks so much. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Kenyon. Thanks very much. And again, thanks to NASGW for um, promoting this and sponsoring this. When we, you know, George and I talk and others about what would the audience, what the members want to hear, and, you know, we, we hear a lot about um, organizations uh, doing things for their customers without asking their customers what they want. In fact, there's an extremely small percentage of companies that actually formally go out and survey their customers. Uh, last poll we did was 65% of them, you know, don't do it formally. Uh, and then you, and then we hear about, um, you know, owners or people, individuals in firms designing guns based on what they think they would like to see, and therefore assuming everyone would like else like to see, which we know is really not the right way to do this. So that's what generated this topic. Uh, so everyone knows that's listening in here, uh, who else is here? Uh, Demographic-wise, we have about 25% of those listening are presidents or CEOs, uh, and then 48% or 50% are sales and marketing uh, executives, so the mix being, the rest of that being business development or research related. And then um, about 75% listening are manufacturers, the other being distributors or, or, or other uh, organizations. So just to give you a little background there. What we're trying to do, what we'd like to do today, and the goals here is this. First, emphasize the importance of obtaining formal customer feedback, okay? The importance of doing it formally, and then show you how to do it. And we're gonna walk you through, A, you know, show you formally how to do it, what is good customer feedback, what is it and how do you collect it, and then uh, really the guts of it, which we're going to try to drive to quickly, is discussions with Jens and Jeff on studies that they've done and the results that they've obtained. So um, myself, Chris Desenzo, the good guy in the top left-hand corner, good looking. Um, I'm an engineer by, by trade, actually worked for Sturm Ruger coming out of school, uh, some great years. Went back to school, got my MBA, and joined the consulting world with Deloitte. Price, Whitehouse Coopers, Inc. Magazine, and a few others, and started Growth Strategy Partners in 2003 with the goal of helping, you know, privately held organizations take their business to the next level uh, and grow it and improve it. And through that, we've developed what we call these seven keys to growth that you'll see. Uh, personally, I shoot IDPA, USPSA, uh, Three Gun Now, 
just before the call, we we're talking about the dogs that we have and the upland bird hunting that we do. Um, you know, my goal today is really to help to help you understand how to understand your customers and therefore how to sell more. George, how about yourself? Uh, well, I've been in the industry in various capacities for about 40 years. Uh, paralleling that, uh, both active and reserve, uh, I spent as long as they would have me in the uh, Army uh, as a competitive shooter, uh, small arms uh, uh, expert, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, range development and all that kind of wonderful stuff. And uh, I've got a few international and national accomplishments under my belt, let's say. Uh, probably one of the more prouder times in my life was uh, the 21 years that I spent at the Sig Sauer Academy as uh, assistant director and then uh, as the director. Uh, retired in 2011. And uh, actually, that's where you and I uh, kind of ran into one another and, and uh, started to talk a little bit. I formed my own business as International Firearms Consultants to deal strictly with uh, firearms from the sporting, uh, competitive, uh, personal defense, so on standpoint. And, uh, you know, we uh, joined forces at SHOT Show, I think it was, what, 2012? And found Something out that like we, that, actually, yeah. we, we actually could work together, which uh, was unusual for you. But anyhow, um, we have uh, worked together with uh, 20 projects, 20 different companies, and uh, all successfully. And uh, you know, we we enjoy doing what we do. So uh, I think everybody will find, in, in listening to what we do today, that uh, we're passionate about it. We enjoy it, and uh, we're successful, if you will. Very much so. Jens? Yeah, uh, Chris, George, thanks again for having us today. Uh, really looking forward to this. A um, little bit of background on me. I grew up a competitive shotgun shooter and uh, kind of kind of let that drop when I went to school and, and got out of college and went straight into the gun business as a, uh, a factory rep and then a manufacturer's rep. and. Um, got into a, a product management role and, and did that for a few years in sales and channel marketing after that and uh, just moved out here to STI about a year ago. Uh, we're right outside of Austin, Texas, uh, employee owned. Uh, hopefully most of you guys know who we are. We make uh, high-end 1911s and 2011s, so uh, race guns has kind of always been our specialty and uh, it's a really, really fun business, really fun customer base. So. Thank you. Thanks, Jens. Jeff? Uh, hi, thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> Jeff Creamer with uh, SIG Sauer. I've been with SIG uh, a little over eight years. Um, George had the misfortune of uh, hiring me as a deputy director at the academy, which is how I started into the company. Um, and then went into head up uh, SIG's product management team. Uh, and now I'm focused on um, what happens strategically uh, basically, once once the product leaves the building, so focused on um, the the retail experience, the dealer experience, uh, promotions, programs, uh, etc. And uh, prior to that, spent about 20 years in mostly Fortune 500 retail, not industry related. Thanks, Jeff. And a quick uh, growth strategy partners talked a little about George heard about the you know. 18, 20 companies we've worked with in the firearms industry. You can see that down below. Really, our goal is to help you be more successful, improve the profits, improve the growth performance. We've done some research to identify what drives growth, and that's kind of the science-driven approach because I'm an engineer. So why are we going to collect formal customer feedback? Okay. Um, what are you, you going to collect it for? Well, geez, if you're going to design some firearms, design some accessories, uh, look at what products maybe you might want to have, product lines you want to have, understanding the trends, uh, improving your customer service, you need to hear that from the customer. You, you can't sit, nobody can sit in their ivory tower in their office and decide that they know what they want to do. Um, and, the, and the bottom line here, what you're trying to do is really outperform your competition. In order to do that, you need to understand what your customer wants specifically, not generally. I can't tell you how many times we have conversations with 
uh, sales execs and presidents and owners and talk about talking to their customer and you keep hearing, oh, we talk to them all the time, you know, which is just the conversation but not a formal feedback system. So that's what we want to talk about today, not using the crystal ball, using the binoculars, trying to get a little, a little vision of the future and therefore to design firearms, design accessories and or stock the right stuff, the right quantities so you can be more successful. If you do this, you will no doubt uh, grow your revenues, uh, grow your profits. In fact, there's a research here from uh, Southwick Associates uh, based on some research that they've done. This is a market research firm. We'll talk a little more about later. Uh, their feedback in the kitchen, 90%, 90% of this year's products will not succeed. And, you know, as I, as I talked to Rob Southwick about this, he said it's because they don't understand what they're designing, why they're designing, what the customer wants. So this is really what the need is for. Now, you know, we'll talk about how to get customer feedback, what it is and what it isn't. You know, kind of a little, a little, a little push here against the Internet, but these forms, this is not what we're talking about as feedback. We're not talking about these little forms and the comments that you hear on on Facebook, Twitter, and so forth like that. You'll also see a little a little the picture here, the graphics of the um, the handgun magazines or the gun magazines, of which we've got a few of the publications actually online here listening. Um, not saying that those are not valuable uh, uh, feedback, but even though it's just one writer. Okay, and granted they go out and get feedback from from you know their constituents and so forth like that, but not great necessarily. Um, quantitative feedback. Uh, I am going to jump a little quickly here because I was talking to Jens earlier uh, and about this slide in particular and Jens you actually uh, have used this though in more of a quantitative method. You want to explain that? Yeah absolutely. Uh, I first saw this slide and, and push back on Chris a little bit. Um, we like to use social media uh, a pretty good bit but from kind of a different angle. We're not going out and saying, hey guys, what do you think about this? We go on and we look at top shooters pages or just um, really enthusiast pages and see what pictures they're posting of guns, reading people's comments about it and seeing how much traction they get on that. How many shares are they getting? How many likes are they getting? You know, if a customer uh, or customers repeatedly like one aspect of a gun, then then that aspect is probably a winner. And so we can kind of go on and, and more observe than ask for feedback, um, just kind of see what's trending and see what people really like to look at. Thanks, Jens. Uh, and, you know, not to, you know, again, uh, say bash Facebook magazines or anything like that, but uh, what we really want to talk about is quantitative feedback, okay? You know, here's an example here out of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, some research that they did. You know, it talks about the single most important reasons why people buy their first gun. And you've got quantitative feedback. You can see self-defense, home defense, and so forth like that. So what we want to talk more about today is the quantitative approach and the value of that. Uh, Southwick, again, shared with us, here's another great uh, feedback mechanism, something they did on fishing line, monofilament line, the fishing line, that talks about the different brands and, you know, why did they like it? Was it packaging? Was it the strength? Was it the price, the sensitivity? How, how much does color impact this? So this is what we really want to talk about today is getting more quantitative or close to quantitative uh, when you start getting customer feedback to improve your business, build products, uh, improve your service. Um, what I want to do actually is uh, get a little sense of the audience here is take a take a poll and so I'm going to ask you to actually do some work now and the poll is going to ask you you know um, how often do you formally survey your customers and what I'll ask you to do is actually click on you know annually at least annually we do it or every few years that we do it uh, Usually we do it when we're introducing a new product. Maybe we do it if my memory's good. We did it once somewhere, or no, we we never do it. So trying to try to get a sense here on the audience side, how often are you actually doing a formal survey? We getting something quantitative? Uh, great, we got over seventy percent responding so far. So I'm just going to wait a, another few seconds, and then uh, 
we'll pre present this up and uh, show what the results are. So let me do this here. Um, okay, so let me let me show you. I'm going to close this and I'm going to show you the results and let's talk about it a little. Okay, so uh, let's take the biggest number, 38%. Never do it, but we do have 25% that do. Uh, George, I'm going to ask you, um, what's your reaction to something like this? Um, actually, it's better than I thought. Um, most people don't do a, a, a very good job of, of um, polling their customers at all, and at least uh, you know the 25% annually, that's outstanding. I think um, one time before we did a poll similar to this, and we got 65% of the folks that never did do anything. So you know, maybe some of these same folks uh, heard about the uh, the initial poll and have uh, uh, changed their ways, reformed a little bit. So progress being made. Yeah, that's a good thing. Good. That's yeah. a good thing. You, so you fifty five percent that that you know maybe once if my memory is good to never, but you do have that twenty five percent up top that's doing at least annually. So that's yeah, actually right. great. That's great. Let me um, move on here and let's talk now about um, what do you collect and how do you collect it. Okay, so now first of all, you know what you'll see here is a list of things you can collect on the product side and on the service side. But when you start getting into what to collect, the first thing is what's important to you. What are you trying to collect on the product side? Is it a, is it a new product? You're trying to get some features on um, some existing product. You're trying to get feedback on warranty repair. I know a lot of the companies on the manufacturing side on the shooting sports, you know, they have their bingo warranty repair cards or warranty cards to get some feedback there. What are you looking to collect? And then you might need to adjust that. Uh, we've actually got a, a client that we've done a cultural survey, actually, of their employees uh, for five years in a row. We keep adjusting it uh, based on what we learn. Early on, some of the issues might have been uh, retention and compensation and then it started changing into culture and benefits and some of the other things so you know what do you collect really should be based on what's important what are you trying to to um, to to learn uh, you will you'll actually hear a little later you know from Jeff from SIG of what provoked one of their service um, surveys so here's a quick list of, of what to collect let's talk a little about how you collect it we'll just get in some of the meat here uh, we've broken this into, uh, we've got five categories. In the top left-hand corner is in-person. You can collect information at, at shows, uh, when your reps are going out to dealers. Uh, in-person is a great way to collect information. We actually advocate this a lot because you can have a conversation. It's not just an online survey and you get scores and numbers, but you can actually have a conversation with people. There in the middle, you have the phone. Obviously, you can do phone surveys. You got the old snail mail, uh, mail approach. Low left-hand corner, you've got the online approach. So yeah, you can use SurveyMonkey. I think Jeff's gonna uh, share a little bit. It's one of the tools that they've used at SIG. And yeah, you can do things through Facebook or other um, online uh, forums and portals. And then, and then the right-hand corner here is what I'll call the the paid um, surveys. Um, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, uh, Southwick Associates, uh, IDPA, USPSA, a lot of the organizations, I think NASGW, you know, collects, does their own surveys. Uh, we've used the National Shooting Sports Foundation research and for actually many of our clients. It's a great place. It's, it's pre-established uh, surveys, like the one I showed you earlier on, you know, why do people choose their first gun, but it's another place to go to get information. And Let me say, say uh, you know, when you <clears throat> when you have the personal contact and and the the phone surveys, uh, you know, a lot of people think just a casual conversation is the is the name of the game. And literally, you've got to plan it ahead of time, script it to uh, some degree, and uh, lead the conversation when you're having these conversations in order to get valuable information. It's not just a BS session, with, you know, some guy that walked up to the booth, so to speak. And exactly. That, 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 that goes right back in with the, the the professional organizations. You know, they've got a plan and they've got uh, uh, set uh, 
set of questions, so to speak, to uh, get that information as quickly as possible and, and valid information. And we'll actually share one of those surveys with uh, those listening in a little later on today. So depending upon, again, what you want to learn, you'd now need to decide how you're going to go about doing that. And we'll talk again a little more through the case studies today on different approaches that have been used. Then, the finger works, um, you should think about who's going to collect it. Um, I, I think more often when, when we talk to owners and executives about why they haven't got something done, well, I don't have enough time. I've got all these projects on my list. You know, that's one reason why you would decide a, not to do it from a resource perspective, but let's say you have the time, kind of working backwards on this slide, but why would you use an outside firm? And there's a, and there's a list here you can see, obviously, you know, significant risks. If there's some new markets that are going out there, you need something done statistically. As I was talking to Rob Southwick about all the different blind, coaxial, double joint analysis that he does, it's like, that's great, I'm an engineer, I still not following what he's saying. Uh, but there's times when you might want to use an outside firm. And, you know, Southwick's one that does some great things, obviously things that we do. Uh, but think about who's going to collect this information, not just collect it, but design it, collect it, analyze it, and provide some feedback. So let's uh, jump into some real live case studies of where this has been done. I'm going to start with Jens with STI. Jens? Yeah, so um, about midway through the year last year, uh, we had been working on a project for a new um, USPSA or IPSC limited division gun. So uh, we wanted to develop something that was um, somewhat unique, and we really wanted to find out what our customers want in a race gun. Uh, what are they doing after they buy a gun? You know. Um, a lot of these guys were, were buying one of our more standard models and then spending five or six or seven hundred dollars aftermarket to have certain things done and we saw a lot of repetition there. We saw a lot of people doing the same things to those guns after they bought them. So we kind of decided to take the approach that we were going to bring those features and, and give them to the factory, uh, give them to the customer from the factory. I like to use the, the Ford Raptor example because it's we're here in Texas and everybody drives a truck and nobody drives a stock truck. So Ford um, really did a, a good job finding out what their customers want and uh, giving it to them from the factory. So really our, our input and key insights came from dealers, top shooters, and firearms design experts. And when I say firearms design experts, I mean these uh, mainly gunsmiths. Um, guys that were working on consumers' guns after they bought them. So we reached out to a lot of them and our key dealers and, and top shooters. Uh, and the results were about 4x what we initially thought. So they were uh, pretty pretty good results. Chris, you want to... It wasn't you over? sandbagging as a sales guy? <laughs> no, I didn't even come up with the forecast. They, they wouldn't <laughs> let me. I, was, I hadn't been here long enough. So... Uh, why, don't you, why don't you go through, you know, in the more detail what you did, how you did it, and, and what you learned. Yeah, so so we started with um, something simple, something basic. We said we know we want to change the slide cuts. We want to change a few things. So we um, came up with a, a few engineering drawings, kind of of a baseline, and um, took it out to our, our round table of experts, our, our three or four dealers, our three or four shooters, and then the three or four um, gunsmiths and then um, apply their feedback, make some changes, and then um, basically go out for a, uh, another round of, um, of surveying. So you can see here where we started on the left with a, a simple slide design and then matched it up with a, a frame and gun design with a, a few different cuts and added in, uh, most notably on this one with the slide, we added in the, the gold titanium nitride barrel and the cuts on the top of the slide. So we started there, went to um, went to the picture on the right, and then, uh, Chris, if you want to flip it over to the next slide, took that out again and, and got more specific with things and, and asked more people uh, more questions. So we, we took this image essentially out to a lot of matches, uh, both local matches. We were at nationals last year. We were at the world shoot last year. Uh, we had some uh, international customers have input and 
basically we we added the stylized cuts, we added the stippled grip, uh, we added the the symmetry within the lightning cut. So there's there's three cuts on top and three cuts on the bottom and changed a lot of the aesthetics. The the internals of the gun, the things you can't see, um, is is kind of the hard part. It's a it's a feel thing. So we it was a little bit more difficult to to pull people on, but we took the general guidelines of what they wanted, a two and a half pound trigger, a, um, a toolless guide rod or some kind of recoil system that was easy to maintain and uh, basically they wanted a, a few other internal things polished and, and so we did all that and applied it to the gun. Um, probably spoke to, uh, it's tough to put an exact number, but somewhere between 175 and 225 people um, overall and, and gathered input, um, but at the end we were really only asking ourselves one question. We were asking ourselves, what does the customer want to buy? What does this competitive shooter want in a gun? Not a factory gun, but a gun overall that he, that he won't have to tweak or won't have to go. He can pull it out of the box and, and go win a national championship with it. And that's kind of the the input that we took and, and came up with a, a pretty successful product. Um, one of our team shooters, a, a young man out in Arizona, um, got his DVC on a Thursday and set a, uh, a world record on a USPSA qualifier the following Sunday. So he had a out-of-the-box gun ready to go, had it for about three days and, and set a world record with it. And that's exactly what we set out to do when we started this project. That's awesome. It gives, it gives you all the credibility in the world. Yeah, yeah, it's been a it's been a fun project and, and I'm excited uh, for SHOT Show this year to watch it evolve and, and see the um, the additions to the line that we've made. Right now it's it's more or less two models. Uh, so we'll have a, a few more new ones coming out and really excited to see how people react to them. I know uh, I've got the, I don't know necessarily the predecessor to this, but the base gun that this is built on being the, the edge of the executive that I have, and now I have this one, and it's, it's, it's night and day. It's the, same, it's the same foundation, but what a difference, especially when I'm out, you know, uh, shooting it. I get definitely a lot more questions on this one. What is it? Where did you get that? Um, what's the, what's, what's the, um, the big learning for you as you went through this process? Um, and the outcome or the results of the ahas. Um, you know, you one know. of the one of the key things I learned is um, looks really do matter. Um, today's gun buyer, today's competitive shooter, is really not just looking for a gun that functions at the highest level possible. We can give him that. We can give him that all day long. That's what we're good at. It's what we're known for. But what he wants is a gun that's going to look good while he does it. He's looking for um, just the right amount of, of bling and, and balance in the gun. And, um, you know, really I was just shocked about how passionate our consumers were about the, uh, the way the gun looks. And, and we uh, hit a bit of a home run with the, the combination we have here, and people seem to really like it, and it, it draws their eye uh, at the retail level. Um, and a, a lot of what we see on social media is feedback of, oh my God, that's a beautiful gun. Please take my money now. When can I get it? And um, and that sort of thing, which has sort of landed us in a in a big back order situation. If you want one of these guns today, um, it'll take four or five months to get it. Unless you're listening in today, then they got a special back door, right? <laughs> okay. Well, Let's I don't know, Chris. Well, it's you know interesting with the with the the, the visual piece because I know that's a thing that George just totally disagrees with and thinks it's a bunch of malarkey. Is that right, George? Uh, no, no, no. I mean the 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 three keys to to putting a gun in the hands of the consumer, uh, it's got to look good first, it's got to feel good second, and then it's got to give a perception of of value for you know whatever the the price tag is third. Uh, visual sense is the most powerful sense that we have, and uh, you know we're creatures of symmetry. I've worked with other manufacturers as well as you know with with Sig, and and um, you know we always look to uh, put something in front of the customer that is pleasing to the eye, 
uh, even working with the distributors and the dealers, you know, you've got to have something that attracts their visual attention. And then if it, when they pick it up, it feels good, you pretty well got it sold from that perspective. Uh, you know, you, you've hit the two major senses that uh, cause you to do things. You've triggered them in a positive manner. So you know, the only thing left to do is to exchange the money. Here we go. All right, let's move on. I'm going to move on to Jeff, and, and uh, I'll ask the audience if you have any questions specifically for, for Jens and or, or, or Jeff. Uh, in your little window there, you can type some questions in, and we'll try to get to them uh, at the end. Uh, let's go to Jeff. Let's talk about SIG. Uh, okay. Uh, so one of the things that uh, recently um, organizationally transitioned for SIG is that uh, we migrated from a, uh, a factory uh, inside sales team and a small outside sales team to um, uh, utilizing the services of uh, some manufacturer rep groups uh, across the country, and, and we're really able to to go from having six or seven guys uh, on the ground to having 50 guys on the ground, um, and ability to to better interface with. Um, with, with dealers across the country. And as we were going through that transition, uh, a lot of the feedback from the manufacturers reps who were, who were new to the brand and, and, and new to the dealers in a lot of cases that they were servicing said, um, you know, hey, we're getting a lot of feedback that, that SIG's not the easiest to do business with. And um, w which obviously was cause for concern for us and, and we wanted to identify what that, what that was other than anecdotally. Uh, so we created um, a, a formal survey, a uh, scripted survey, and uh, selected uh, a little over 100 dealers to, to schedule time with, call, and then take through a scripted you know, survey uh, format um, so that we could identify what, you know, what really was the perception. And what we found uh, in talking with some of the dealers that we didn't even have a direct relationship with was that the biggest frustration uh, in dealing with SIG uh, was the perception that without a formal map policy um, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of negative margin pressure uh, in reacting to the multiple ways that SIG was distributed primarily through internet only retailing and the brick and mortar guys uh, had a high degree of frustration about the margin impact that they were suffering in, in terms of trying to respond to the walk-in customer who had a printout from the computer or whipped out their tablet or their phone and said, uh, hey, teach me about this gun, but you know, I can get it at X internet retailer for a lot less, so I'm going to do that, and then uh, how much are you going to charge me for the transfer? Uh, and so it created a high degree of frustration um, and, and ill will towards the brand. So in understanding what the, uh, we'll be able to, to quantify that, um, and, and actually have then follow-up conversations with, with brick and mortar, uh, internet, uh, chain stores, you know, kind of the whole gamut of, of MAP and, and other manufacturers that, that uh, aggressively enforce MAP and, and set a hard MAP policy. We, we decided that the best thing for the brand and the best thing to respond to the frustration in the field was, was to do just that. And this was relatively quick. Um, we we executed that survey um, uh, formally in April, and then July one instituted a uh, a formal map policy that we actually hired staff uh, to enforce and monitor the program. Um, and uh, you know, it's a map policy that is more than just on paper. It's got teeth, and and we wanted everybody to play on a level uh, level playing field. Uh, so we employ technology uh, and uh, to crawl looking for map violations, um, which is amazing uh, in and of itself. And then, of course, the dealer base as a whole is pretty willing to, um, to help uh, if they can identify somebody, a uh, competitor, <laughs> violating map uh, to help us out and point us in the right direction. Um, and ultimately, what's happened uh, since, since July uh, is that the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive from the same dealers who uh, collectively were frustrated. So uh, just a kind of a microcosmic look at uh, the ability to get 
targeted information about uh, service opportunities or, or, or policy opportunities that uh, resulted in, I think, ultimately a positive for SIG. Uh, and I'm not going to say that 100% of the people are happy because a lot of the guys that were making a living off of uh, short margin, high volume, uh, no longer are doing that. But uh, our key partners, um, uh, the feedback that we've gotten consistently is that uh, now it is a level playing field and now the things that make them successful like their ability to service the customer, their ability to attract the customer, the environment that they're providing, the training, whatever the case is, is giving them the com competitive advantage and they're not just responding to price. So um, all in all I think it was a positive step and, and we look, that was the first time that we've actually formally surveyed our dealer base and we will continue to do that. Because you found great benefits out of it, and specifically, obviously, for this map side. Yeah. Did you? Just curious. A little pet peeve of mine is is this one percent, you know, vocal minority that that cause a big stink, and then people create like you know, um, uh, football inflation policies. Uh, but we won't <laughs> go there. Um, yeah. Did you? You heard that there were a few that were complaining when you went and did the survey. Did you find it was a lot broader than that, or? Yeah, and that's that's why we that's actually why we did the survey, and that's why we targeted uh, who we targeted because um, the the feedback that we were getting anecdotally was kind of all across the country, um, and we went after dealers both that we had a direct relationship and dealers that we did not. Um, so we really wanted to expand that base and get get a clearer picture and not just respond to you know he said she said kind of stuff. So yeah, that's a good point. Great. Why don't you tell us about the uh, the 320? Uh, okay, yeah, that's a that's a much longer uh, process, but but I think speaks to uh, to the topic at hand and and uh, uh, Sig, you know, uh, made its bones and, and reputation on um, hammer fire, double action, single action, metal frame guns, uh, and continues to do you know very well uh, in that category. Uh, the reality of the situation is, um, and and I don't I don't throw 1911 into this mix uh, or 2011 for that matter. Being an owner of a 2011, so yeah, and, you know, you know, take a pause on yeah. here. But the, you know, the significant uh, portion of the handgun market was really trending towards uh, polymer uh, striker fired guns, um, and a significant concern for us was that we weren't participating. In that in that market share, uh, so we realized we we probably needed to uh, not probably needed to we we really needed to enter into, into that category uh, and get a foothold. But we also knew we didn't want to do uh, you know a me too gun. So the question was if the if the customer is actually making that purchase decision, you know. Um, what was it? There was a lot of speculation. You know, it's it's all price. It's all you know, five hundred dollar guns, and um, it doesn't really matter, and and all that. But w we we felt strongly that we wanted to be there, and we wanted to be there in the way that Sig typically goes there, and that's at least to, to try to have something innovative um, and different. Uh, so the first step in trying to ascertain what that was is is identify what the two major markets were for, for the consumption of, of this category, and that was the law enforcement market and the commercial market. Um, and a lot of people, uh, and, and having this conversation before, arched their eyebrows a little bit because the law enforcement market in comparison to the commercial market is such a minor slice of the pie. However, it's very difficult to overstate the influence that the law enforcement has on the commercial buying pattern. Um, so we we actually created um, uh, feature set surveys. Uh, there was a 14 or 15 question um, survey. We did it electronically, um, f and one was geared towards the law enforcement. One was geared towards the commercial market. On the on the commercial customer side, the initial pool that we used was our internal database of of warranty registrants, um, people that had signed up for. Uh, sweepstakes, giveaways, anybody that we had interacted to that we were able to um, uh, have a means to communicate with them electronically. And uh, the 15, the 14 or 15 questions were really um, geared towards uh, gun purchase behavior and then we tried to narrow that down into um, feature sets that they were looking for and we were really primarily driving towards customers that had looked at or had um, purchased a competitive uh, pistol that fell within 
that category of uh, striker fired polymer uh, center fire pistol. And once we uh, were able to extract that group, then we, we subsetted them and then went after them with a second survey uh, of identifying the features uh, that were most important to them when they made that selection or were considering making that selection. And we did this both for law enforcement and, and the commercial consumer. What we found uh, once we got that data back, and this is over the course of uh, it's probably a six-month period, is that we had what we felt uh, in terms of survey results analytically um, a pretty mirrored set, ne not necessarily in the same priority order, but a pretty mir uh, uh, mirrored set of features. And what came back was, you know, the feel or the fit, um, the the way the trigger operated. Uh, the price, the brand reputation, uh, and the overall safety of the system. Um, the, where those factors fell uh, differed slightly between the law enforcement group and the uh, consumer group. Um, and then we were able to subset uh, that data and actually uh, host, and, and we used an outside service to do it, uh, both the survey and the, uh, and then we went, then went to a focus group environment. And we held um, some law enforcement focus groups where we targeted uh, range master. We, we weren't targeting necessarily people that were making purchase decisions. We were targeting um, the people that were involved in the training or the actual uh, use. So, so tip it, you know, patrol, SWAT, range masters, et cetera, on the law enforcement side. And on the commercial side, we were really trying to segregate uh, new buyers or new shooters, um, competitive shooters and enthusiasts uh, and kind of in a mixed format and we held a couple different focus groups on that to try to better identify um, when they walked into a store um, you know how much research were they doing before they got there when they got into the store what were they looking at in terms of comparison between uh, competitive offerings and we wound up with a feature set that we felt um, we needed to focus on um, and Ultimately, that drove probably two years after that initial set of surveying uh, the introduction of the P320, which was SIG's first striker-fired pistol. Um, the the end result of that was that um, very quickly um, we started to see major agency adoption on the law enforcement side, much quicker than we had with uh, other new introductive uh, platforms, uh, and a almost perpetual state of back order um, on the commercial side. So as we, you know, continue to, to uh, add um, calibers and sizes and colors um, and continue to ramp up production, uh, it's, been, it's been very successful for us and at least now we feel like we have a competitor uh, in that space, which two years ago we weren't, uh, we weren't participating in. And to your credit, you, uh, you changed pretty uh, quickly, uh, the carry model, because there were yes. a lot of people, myself included, that said, we need the compact slide with the full-size frame. And, yep. uh, you know, that was like instant. So thank you for listening on that. <laughs> the, the modularity of the system made that pretty easy to do. <laughs> of course. Uh, of course. I mean, it's, it's about as modular as you can get. So, uh, you know, really, really good. What do you think, Jeff, you would say is the big takeaway that you gained by doing the survey? And it was actually, again, iterative, right? You did some uh, electronic, then focus groups was an iterative yeah. process. What do you think that you gained out of that that you wouldn't have gained if you designed it internally? Well, I think, you know, um, and, and I think um, some, some people, George, particularly uh, associated with SIG over the time uh, historically, uh, SIG you know, almost exclusively uh, was driven by engineering. And I think Chris, you made the point earlier that, you know, the engineers think it's a good idea, so everybody else must too. Cool. Um, and that, that drove a lot of the product introductions. And probably in and about 2010, 2011, there was a shift um, philosophically that maybe that's not the best way to go. Um, and I think that the huge takeaway from the 320 um, project was that, uh, we learned a tremendous amount um, and, and actually uh, fit and learned uh, rather starkly that some of the assumptions that the internal development team were making were wrong um, relative to um, 
you know the way we think we should do it versus the way the customers thought it should be done um, and 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 it actually stopped um, uh, specific you know R&D tracks you know dead um, when the customer came back loudly and said no no that's that's actually dumb we don't we <laughs> not not interested in that I'm interested in this um, so I think what we've learned too and, and we we did it uh, in in a different way um, with another recent introduction um, in that we did the exact same thing but we didn't do it commercially we did it um, on the military side um, and re really took a, a aggressive approach with focus groups on feature sets that resulted in the introduction of the MCX rifle system yeah, um, nice. so one of the things that, that you know I have to commend you know, SIG on is they use the guys, the operators, the users as uh, as uh, idea producers, and uh, you know through the academy as well as you know customers. And, you know, very quite a, quite a bit of input there. And and on top of that, another company, a major company um, that we actually have two listeners uh, uh, employed by that I've worked with uh, on a consulting basis. Um, we um, took all of their engineers, both pistol and rifle, and ran them through courses on how to use these things and how the customer uses these things. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we actually had new product models just through that training of working with their engineers that uh, came out in you know, months. So, you know, a, a little bit of education from the outside, from the, the operator or the user's perspective is, is totally invaluable. You've had a... Um a similar example ourselves, George, um, we had a client a few years ago uh, asking us if they should introduce a, you know, modern sporting rifle. Sure. And, uh, you know, we actually went through this, again, the, the process of, they actually had a good customer list, uh, so there's a little bias on there they're all customers, but they had a couple different divisions. And we did some surveys, formal surveys with them. You see some of the results here. You know, one of the questions being, you know, what what you're likely of buying. You know, we have an AR here, but modern sporting rifle, and um, got some good feedback out of this. But even better, you know, because of the connections that we have, we've been able to actually put together some focus groups. Uh, Jeff talked about focus groups, and we put some focus groups together to kind of validate this and, and also provide some input. You know, the outcome of this was yes, people would buy um, a classic. You know, modern, uh, modern sporting rifle, classic modern. How do we how do we get that classic modern sporting rifle? Um, yeah, coincidentally, this result, the the survey was done just before um, an incident happened here in the United States. And so they, Newtown. They, yeah, and they decided not to do it. So, uh, so the data driven approach is kind of what we're trying to drive here today. Is extremely valuable in providing some insights. We've, we've got some questions for, for Jeff and Jen, but I want to get through a few more slides and then we get those at the end here. One of the things that we advocate uh, is, is a general survey. Uh, this is actually something that we've used over and over again with our clients and the clients love it. Uh, this is actually more of an in-person, excuse me, an in-person or a phone conversation or survey. You know, George, you talked about a scripted survey and this is, this is it. This is one that we've used to get a general understanding of why does a company do business? Why does a supplier or a customer do business with the company? And you'll see, you know, top three reasons why, how would you rank the importance of some characteristics? Um, it's only seven questions on a scale of one to ten. You know, how would you rate our company overall? Who are some of your top performing suppliers? Who are, the, who are their competitors? And then it actually gets into, you know, uh, wallet share. How much of your business do you do with us? To start understanding where's there an opportunity to sell more. This is something uh, we actually had a client that was doing these what what we refer to as warranty cards. But after they did a project, they would give out a warranty card and get some scores on it. And they were using that actually to pay out bonuses for some of the the project teams. And they converted to this and got much better answers because they're having conversations with their customer and not just getting numbers back. So, what's um. How do you do this? What, what are the steps, the, the, the major steps? We've outlined six and a half or seven major steps. First, start by understanding what information you want to collect and what are you going to do with it. Then, how are you going to get the, the population, the study, 
and do you need to do it or do you need an outside organization? We had a slide on that earlier. You need to design the study, conduct the study, and then analyze the results and then have all these debates internally about what the results really say. And then when you get the results back, you say, geez, but I want to go back and ask again, which again, we heard with, with, with Jeff and we've done this and even and with Jen's kind of a multi-phased approach. But then plan on some implementation and focus on something simple, okay, a quick win. Going out and get a, a product, a brand new product line is going to be more complex than getting some customer service feedback. There's also a big piece of this, which is communicating the results internally of why you're doing this and how important it is to the whole organization. And then there's the whole repeat process. So we just kind of outlined, you know, the, the macro. So there's a lot of detail behind this. But one of the questions I have uh, for the audience, and there's going to be another poll here, so we're going to get tested again, is what's your challenge going to be? What's your greatest challenge in conducting your own survey? What's the greatest challenge you're going to face in surveying your customers? So I'll ask you to uh, click on one of these. It could be you know, getting buy-in from the, from the president, the CEO, or your team to actually do it. Could be developing the survey, identifying you know that population, uh, changing the paradigms of the company. You know maybe you're going to get the answers back and you don't want to hear the answers. Jeff actually you know you inferred that right. Um, you got some feed, but your internal assumptions. You used one of the keywords that I like because the assumptions that was being made internally at Sig was very different than what the customer was saying. Is your organization willing to change on that? And then you've obviously got the the time or leader to do the project. So let's um, get some clicks on that, and we'll show the results and be ready to wrap up and actually get some more questions. So if you have more questions you want to ask, uh, please add those also in that uh, question window. Okay, we've got just about everybody replying. Oh, still more, still more going here. I'm going to close this up, and interesting results. It's interesting when I can see it. All right, so I'm going to close this and share it. And uh, let's let's talk and move on. So there we go. Should be seeing the results now. The biggest challenge is going to be changing paradigms. Um, followed by finding time, identifying context. Looks like developing the survey and obtaining buy-in is not going to be an issue. That's awesome. Uh, Jeff, you want to talk on a ad hoc here about the paradigms? You, you inferred a little about what engineering, you know, engineering at SIG being the driver and now getting feedback from the customer. Uh, how did that work at SIG? What's, how, how are the, basically some paradigms being changed? Um, yeah, and I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure that in this particular instance that the paradigm is necessarily the, the right term. I think it, it really was uh, design intent and assumption that was... Uh, that was that was affected um, by the customer results, and, and you know, and one of the things um, it, when engineers and Chris, you're an engineer, so I know you'll relate to this. Um, uh, engineers get excited about their own ideas, uh, yeah. and and, and um, you know, one of um, one of the things that that an assumption going into this was, hey, if we can deliver. Uh, a product that does um, that incorporates features that that people are are wanting, and we gave you a, a, a striker fired pistol that had restrike. Um, that would put us over the top, and everything was being driven around restrike, restrike, restrike. And what we found out from both the law enforcement side and the commercial side is either I don't know what that means, or I once I know what that means, I don't care. And it, and from an engineering standpoint, that was a very complicated thing to do without affecting the feel of the trigger um, in general. So, so um, the ability to get that feedback and say, stop it, don't even, you know, don't even consider that as a feature set anymore um, was just a, probably the most visible example of a decision that was, was radically affected the R&D effort um, and resulted in a product that actually was much better in terms of uh, how the trigger felt and behaved versus the the any of the competitive product that we were evaluating against. Interesting. Interesting. We actually have a question here. Um, 
actually to Jeff and to Jens, and Jeff kind of answered it, but the, it's actually the same question. So I'll ask, I'll ask Jens, Jens, what's the what's the greatest challenge you know that you faced in in doing the survey, getting the results, implementing the changes? Yeah, I'd say one of the one of the toughest things that that we encountered during this process was um, deciding what feedback was important and what feedback was was more fuzz. It was uh, obviously a much less uh, formal process overall, but if you get a group of a, a, a thousand people that you're surveying, you might have 20 or 30 of them who feel very strongly about this one particular aspect, and of that same group of a thousand people, you might have 30 or 40 who feel very strongly the opposite way, and the most difficult part is deciding which way to go. Um, you're never going to make anyone happy, excuse me, you're never going to make everyone happy, um, with a with a single product, but it's trying to figure out what is going to uh, disappoint the fewest amount of people. That's great. That's back to my one percenters or five percenters or how you want to call it, right? Um, let me do this just for sake of time. There's actually a, a, a lot of uh, questions to, to get to. We'll probably have to respond to those uh, individually, but I want to keep us on time. I know if we start on a question, we'll we'll um, we'll probably go over. So let me wrap up here uh, first. Um, you know what we're what we're trying to, to to share with you is the need to formally you know listen to your customers and, and survey them quantitatively whether you're trying to improve your products or your services the business overall. But if you do that, and you, we heard a couple examples today with with Sig and STI that you actually get great results and it will drive it drives revenues. Um, Try something simple first. You know, trying to go out and do your first survey usually in any first project becomes complex with all the different people wanting maybe their opinions heard or so so forth like that. You know, yeah, you can always listen to the engineers because they know what they're doing. But try something simple first. You know, decide if you should if you use an outside firm or just do something again simple inside. Uh, the big thing and what we saw here based on the poll was being able to listen and adapt to what the customer is saying. It may be very different than what you were thinking internally. We were picking on engineers. I am one. I can do that. You know, we all think we know the answer. And and Jeff, you hit upon it when you talk about the assumptions we all make about what, about anything, but what the customer wants. I know what the customer wants. I talk to them every day. Yeah, but you're really listening. So you got a picture of George's dog here in the lower right-hand corner. Because George's dog listens. Uh, I would like to uh, thank first uh, NASGW and um, Gleason there on uh, helping us conduct this. I'd like to thank Jens and Jeff uh, for sharing the insights of the inner workings of SIG and STI. I'd like to thank George, a good partner of mine. I'm still not tired of working with you. This is great. And I will share with the audience that uh, we will have this. This is being recorded, so this will be uh, online at both, I think, NASGW and Growth Strategy Partners probably within a week. I will send a copy of the presentation out to those that here that attended. If you have any other questions uh, going forward, you know, please give us a call. Here's our contact information here. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody and, and have a great weekend. Yeah, call us or email us. We'll be glad to help you out however we can. Thank you, Chris.